Hello again. Uh, for those of you who, who have come in this afternoon, uh, my name's Clive Orchard. Uh, I'm the new temporary warden at Felder Brennan, and uh, it's, uh, it's lovely to be with you. This is my first prayer day, so uh, I'm really loving being here. I was speaking this morning, um, and I'm going to sort of continue uh, on the, the theme that I began uh, with this morning. So just to summarize, uh, we were talking about how God is a God of relationship. God is love. And that he's responsive to us. And that although he's almighty God, he's also our father who loves to be with his sons and daughters. And he invites us to come close, to draw near to him uh, so that we can be whole, but also so that we can partake of what God is doing, the establishment of his kingdom in the earth, and that our prayers can change the future. So here's a question. In God's kingdom, so I, I said this morning, why do we pray? So just taking that a little notch further, in God's kingdom, how does he get his will done? How does God get his will done? Now, I wonder, have you ever heard people say when they're watching the news or hearing about something that they don't approve of, and they say something like, if I was in charge, I would sack the lot of them. Or, not sack the lot of them, I would slap them all in irons and I would uh, put them in jail and I would throw away the key. Are you familiar with that kind of thing? We have the same kind of issues in relation to God and our world because we would love God to just deal with evil and just make it go away. So why doesn't he? So that's just a little trivial question, which uh, I probably won't answer this afternoon, but um, let's have a little dig at it anyway. How does God get his will done? So the traditional picture is that God is a benevolent, a kind dictator. That's the, as I say, the traditional kind of picture. People that perhaps don't have a personal relationship with God. That's how they might see God, that, that God should be all-powerful and that when he speaks, it just happens. For that reason, people get incredibly upset about suffering and they say, how can there be a God when all this is going on? And it's a question that, if we're not wrestling with it, we need to wrestle with, because that's, that's an issue. How do we understand all of that? So as we did this morning, let's look at Jesus for a glimpse as to how does God get his will done? So there's Jesus, age 30. He begins his ministry, as we understand it, three years of ministry, on the earth. Soon after he begins, he, ga he gathers round him a group of disciples, people who were there to learn from him, the 12. Now, these were young men, and uh, they had a lot to learn, like us. So what does Jesus do? He builds a team. He spends hours and hours and hours with them. He makes friends with them, and they watch his every move. They listen to his every word. And they can see the integrity in his life. And then just months later, Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, sends these raw recruits out, two by two, to put chairs out, to hand out hymn books, to uh, sweep up after everyone. No to heal the sick, to raise the dead, 
to declare the kingdom of God. Wow. Jesus delegated that to them. They'd just been on the road for a few months. And then after that, the 12 become 70. And you can imagine, perhaps, that the 12 were perhaps leaders of groups within the 70. And so it went on. As we look at Jesus' earthly ministry, we see the heart of someone who is only too glad to take that risk and to give his ministry away. So we're talking about relationship. We're talking about Jesus' love for his disciples. We're talking about uh, delegation. So maybe there's a hint there of how God gets his will done. And then there's Judas. Judas. Did Jesus deliberately choose someone we might call a wrong'un in order that prophecy might be fulfilled? Alternatively, did Jesus make a mistake? Did he fail to spot the flaws in Judas's character? Well, I, I don't think either of those things. I don't know if you've ever thought about it. I believe, and I think those of us that have been on the road for long enough, would know that if you love someone, it involves trust and it involves risk. You don't know the outcome. Now, again, if this messes with your theology, I apologize, but it's worth thinking about it. I believe with Judas, Jesus took a risk. He invested in Judas, and I don't think that it was inevitable that that particular person would betray the Son of God. And I think God takes the same risk with us. Now, I don't know if that means that God doesn't know the future. Ask somebody else that question. But I think that Jesus, uh, that God, rather, when he relates to us, he invests fully in us. He might know years ahead what we're likely to do, but he still loves us, forgives us, and above all, he invests in us. That's how God gets his will done. Now, you could compare this with um, King Saul. If you, if you know the stories, you know about King David. There are thousands of sermons preached about David, and uh, his exploits fill, you know, many pages. But before him was Saul. God chose Saul to be king. But it says in the Bible that God was sorry that he'd chosen Saul. So does that mean that Saul disappointed God and that actually Saul might have succeeded? Answers on a postcard. But I just have this sense that God is willing to take risks with us and that sometimes it goes wrong. But it doesn't stop God. It might delay the purposes. It might reroute the purposes. But that God is a God who gets his will done through relationship and through love. So does this make God sound weak to you? For some people, I think it would. But I believe actually that this, again, is the heart of why we belong to our God. Because there is a heart. Because there is real relationship and real hope. And we find that we have a place. So, back to our question. How does God get his will done? So, it, we think again of the Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Cooperating together, partnering together, they accomplish their purposes. But then we look in the Bible, and we also see something else, that there is an angelic realm, that there are millions of angelic forces around the earth, apparently performing the works of God at his command. But we also see, the Bible makes clear, that Lucifer 
probably the most senior angel or archangel, rebelled and became the prince of darkness and took with him perhaps millions of other angelic forces. But the, the Bible seems to make clear that, that Lucifer had a delegated authority, that God had given away authority. The New Testament says, talks about Lucifer as being the God of this world. The God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So we see there that, that Satan has real power. And because of sin in the garden, Adam and Eve, right there at the beginning of Genesis, that has perhaps empowered the powers of darkness to wreak their chaos. So we, that's where we find ourselves. We're in the midst of confrontation and battle. And God, somewhere in the midst of that, is working his purposes out. So coming back to that thing of, you know, locking everyone up and throwing away the key, why doesn't God just crush Lucifer and put him out of the picture? That would be much easier, wouldn't it? But he doesn't. Is it because he's weak? No, it's not. I'd like us to look in the uh, book of Job for some clues. If you have got your Bible, have a look at uh, Job chapter 1. So at the beginning of the book of Job, which as you might know, is all about the travails of Job suffering uh, in so many ways. But at the beginning, um, Satan is allowed to use Job as a kind of test case. God gives Satan permission. And uh, let's have a look at um, Job 1, verses 8 to 12. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. Then the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has, that's Job, is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So the point Satan was making was, Job only loves you, God, because of all the things he's got. Take all his stuff away and he'll curse you. So what happens? Job goes through years of immense struggle and self-examination. His friends are, are pretty useless, and um, he has great um, difficulty. But through it all, somehow Job clings on to God and says, whatever you do, I will still love you. And because he does that, not only does Job get back everything he lost and more, but Satan in that particular little battle is vanquished because Job had proved something and by his self-sacrifice, his selflessness, Satan was defeated. And I think that gives us a good clue as to how God gets his will done. He gets his will done through love, through sacrifice, through obedience, and through those who will honor the God of heaven and put God back on the throne. So God is just. He's righteous. And so 
Why doesn't Satan, uh, why doesn't God just crush Satan? Because that would prove that might is right. But right is right. There's got to be righteousness. And God is love, and he will not breach his own values. So God must win through love, not just through muscle and might. And we, we need to hold on to that because we, we've got to apply that into our own lives as well. It's much harder to just love, forgive, wait, continue to love, forgive again, than it is just to kind of wash your hands of relationships and so on. And uh, that's the way of God. So here is our hope that Jesus laid his life down. And in so doing, on the cross, he undermined the authority of Satan. We, but we were singing about it earlier on. He's won an awesome victory because of self-sacrifice, because of love, and because he was blameless. So Satan's jurisdiction as God of the world has gone. So then, why does evil still prevail? Well, you might have heard this illustration before, but it seems to me that we're between D-Day and VE Day. If uh, my, my dad was in the war, so I kind of grew up with Second World War stuff. But D-Day in 1944 was the beginning of the end. It was when the end of the war became certain. But actually, some of the most vicious reactionary fighting happened after D-Day. The enemy were a spent force, but they fought for survival. And that's where we are. We're between D-Day, the cross, and the final judgment, the end of all things. And so we're in the midst of that somewhere. The victory is sure, but we need to assert the authority of God through our lives laid down, through our love, through our faithful prayers, through our loving one another, through sharing good news. All of these things make Satan's authority wither away. So it's as we do those things, to love, to serve, to trust, to continue, even when we can do nothing else because we just feel spent and broken, but we just say, well, I'm, st I'm still here, Lord. That is powerful. Like Job, just saying, I I've got nothing but I'm still here and I love you. That is immense authority and power because it brings the presence of God down. It brings the authority of God. So we're, we're in a vital place because we can make that difference because God has said it, because he's included us in his family. He loves us and he's, he's, he's put badges on our shoulders to, to speak in his name. God didn't have to need us, but he's chosen to need us. Let's pray. Lord, we, <clears throat> we are in many ways on, on holy ground because we are just in awe of the architecture of your kingdom, that love is at the center, that you did not choose to use might and force, but you've chosen to love, and you've included us in. And Lord, we, we just want to line up with you, Lord. We don't have your kind of love. We don't have your kind of forgiveness. We don't have your kind of belief in other people. But Lord, we pray that you would endure us, Lord, with your spirit. Give us your heart, Lord. Give us what we need, Lord. Correct us where our hearts are cold, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
I just want to finish by uh, reading some verses in 1 Corinthians 1. Don't worry about turning to it. This is good. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. The things that are not, so that he might nullify the things that are. Isn't that good? So we get up by going down. The first shall be last, the last shall be first. And it's, in a way, it's the little people that win the biggest battles. And um, we just want to have an opportunity now. We're in a few moments. Um, people can gather at the back to pray for Felder Brennan. But uh, just want to give an opportunity for uh, any of you that want to, to come forward for, for prayer. I just sense that there are some people who, who are willing to step up and to be people who stand in the gap. Maybe people willing to go to the dark places to say, here I am, I'm going to be an agent of light. So if, if that's you and you just want to say, yeah, I'm up for that, then, then come forward and uh, some of the team will come and pray for you. If you sense that you just want a fresh touch from God, you, you want a fresh sense of authority to pray, to stand, to live, to resist the enemy, come and have some prayer. And also, if you simply think, I'm broken, I'm, I'm not in a great place, I feel crushed, I need healing, I need restoration, then come up anyway, because God wants to, wants to really bring some, some healing. So uh, Sam's going to uh, play a song, and uh, just as we stay in God's presence, uh, anyone who wants prayer, come up. Some of the team who are willing to pray, uh, you come up as well, and uh, we will continue, and then... Uh, Stuart will uh, start to gather people to pray for Felder Brennan as well. Mm -hmm.